I'm Reverend Marie Alfred Harkey, and today I'm the face of America. I was a high school teacher for 20 years, and at, well, high school and middle school, and at some point in that journey, I became one of the advisors of the Gay Straight Alliance in my large public high school. And at that point, I started hearing the stories, firsthand stories from students of how they were coming out as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, um, whatever their identity might be, and being told by their families and their churches that they were not okay, um, that they were going to hell. And at that time, the faith that I knew was nothing like that. The Christian faith that I knew was a welcoming faith, was a faith that said that all of us are created in the image of God. And it became increasingly intolerable for me to see people being harmed by religion. And I wanted something to be different. And that's really a huge part of my call story, watching people be harmed and knowing that that, at least for me, was not the heart of what faith means and what it is. Um, and so um, in what some folks call the mother of all midlife crises, I quit my job in my 40s and uh, sold my house and went to seminary, um, not really knowing what would come next. My name is Marie Alfred Harkey. I am an ordained pastor with the Metropolitan Community Churches, which is a denomination that was founded about 50 years ago specifically to welcome gay and lesbian Christians into churches uh, because mainline churches wouldn't welcome gay and lesbian folks. It's now a denomination that welcomes LGBTQ people from around the world and also sees itself as a movement. I'm also the president of the Religious Institute, which is an organization that works for um, the liberation of bodies and spirits from oppression. We work for sexual, gender, and reproductive justice in faith communities and in society. Um, I'm an unabashed Jesus follower, and I am married to uh, the love of my life, whom I also met in seminary. Um, and I am passionate about justice, and in particular, justice for um, around sexuality and gender. Yeah, so we just adopted this beautiful vision statement that says that we recognize that as an organization, it's our responsibility, it's our goal to liberate bodies and spirits from oppression. And we say that because we realize that oppression happens in people's bodies, of course. It happens because people are perhaps gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, because they're black, because they're immigrants, because any number of things. But oppression also happens in faith communities, especially around sexuality and gender. And so this lofty vision is for a world where everybody's bodies and spirits are completely liberated. And we do that work by working for sexual, gender, and reproductive justice in faith communities um, and in society. And in faith communities particularly because especially for, especially around issues of sexuality and gender, that's where a lot of the harm has occurred. And we truly believe that faith and religion can also be a force for healing. And indeed, at their best, they are a force for healing and good and justice in the world. And so that's what we try to enact in every part, in every program that we do, in every part of our work. My parents actually weren't terribly religious, but I grew up in the South, in the southern part of the United States, and so religion is just sort of in the ethos, right? The, the question isn't, do you go to church, but where do you go to church? And so, from a young age, I was involved in church at some, some level, and at about the age of 13, I became very committed to Christianity. Um, in my understanding at that time, um, I was born again. Um, into this very sort of evangelical, um, conservative Christian faith, which was really all there was in, in my part of the world at that time. Um, and so it, it was this haven for me, this place where I was completely accepted, where there was unconditional love, where I had sort of found my tribe and nobody cared if um, I didn't have the latest style clothes or you know didn't look like everybody else. And it was only later that I started chafing against that particular brand of religion because I was consistently being asked to sort of check my brain at the door, not ask too many questions, um, not use my reason and my intellect. And that felt a little bit 
dishonest to me. And so by the time I went to college, I had sort of abandoned faith entirely. I think bisexuality makes people uncomfortable because it moves us beyond binaries. So as I was writing this work and beginning to get in touch with my own bisexual identity, what I realized was that early on, when I came out as a lesbian in the Midwest in the early 90s, bisexual was used as a slur in my community. Um, and I think it's because there's a lot of complexity. If a person can be bisexual, then dividing people into two categories, either gay, lesbian, or straight, doesn't work so well anymore. And I think that's frightening for queer people as well as straight people. Um, the gift, however, of delving into the complexity of sexuality beyond binaries is that contemplating that kind of complexity and that kind of um, complicated interplay of people's romantic, erotic, and affectionate attractions also invites us into contemplating the complexity of what the divine might be in the world. Um, you know, Christians, we talk about how we can never fully know God. Um, and I think that that's also true about fully understanding something as complicated as human sexuality. And those two things for me are really meaningful ways to, to contemplate what is this divine and beautiful and really uh, unending complexity about both human, humanity and what I call God. Religious traditions throughout time have had differing views on when life begins, on abortion, on contraception. Our position at the Religious Institute is that it is up to a person to make that decision for themselves with their own faith community, their own faith commitments, or their own values. Um, but it is not up to anyone else to tell a person what to do. One of the highest values that we hold is that human being, or that I hold at least as a Christian, is that human beings have free will. And free will is difficult. Free will means that we have to grapple with moral decisions. And in that grappling, I think we find our own moral center. And it's just not for anyone else to tell a person what that moral center should be. There are as many different views on abortion and contraception, I dare say, as there are people. But each person should be and must be allowed to make those decisions based on their own convictions in conversation with their faith, with their family, with their community, with their own values. And that is that moral reckoning and wrestling is where each person's relationship with their inmost values comes. And to deny people that relationship, to say that they don't deserve the chance to, to do their own moral work around such an important decision, is to deny their moral agency and their own tenets of their faith. And, it, and to me, it is a contradiction of my faith to impose whatever my beliefs might be on someone else. I think that what's happening around LGBTQ rights in this country is a little scary at this point. Actually, it's a lot scary. Um, what we're seeing, and even more than the Masterpiece case, which I will touch on, even more than that, we're seeing rollbacks of, trans, of, of protections for transgender people in schools and public accommodations. And that, because transgender folks are so marginalized and so at risk, I think that that is even more frightening to me than what's happening in a case like Masterpiece, for example. But I think the overall sense for us as queer people that we're sort of moving backwards is real. And all of us, no matter how many different identities intersect in our bodies, are carrying fear about that and are carrying anxiety about that. The Masterpiece case in particular is an odd piece of jurisprudence, I would say. Um, on the one hand, right, it did narrowly rule in favor of the baker, but on the other hand, what it didn't do, and, and the ju justices were very clear in this opinion, was that it did not give people, a right, businesses, a right to discriminate based on sexual orientation. It ruled very narrowly that the, that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission had been hostile to religion based on some comments that were recorded. Um, what I do know is that the attacks aren't over, that they're going to continue, that Supreme Court cases around LGBTQ rights, justice, discrimination are going to continue to come up. 
and that those of us who believe deeply that each and every person has dignity and worth in the society are going to have to keep up the work that we're doing um, so that our rights don't continue to be rolled back.